starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA, and we're very pleased to be hosting today's webinar with EBM Tools and with Open Channels. And our guest today is Mark Young of the Pew Charitable Trust, who's going to be talking about Project Eyes on the Seas, and I'll introduce Mark in a moment. Uh, what I wanted to do before that is just remind you all that we're going to have a presentation for about 30, 35 minutes, and then there will be plenty of time for q and I imagine this will be a very interesting discussion for a lot of us. Um, so I really encourage you to go ahead and write in your questions along the um, webinar interface, and I will go ahead and facilitate that Q&A session after Mark does his presentation. Uh, so. As you know, illegal fishing is a huge global issue and has an enormous cost, both economically and environmentally. And so there is a lot of interest in uh, addressing ways to, to halt illegal fishing. And, and Pew is actively involved in this. Mark has uh, been supporting the Pew's work to Ill end illegal fishing, as well as other marine conservation campaigns. He joined the trust as a senior officer in conservation enforcement after 23 years in the US Coast Guard where he reached the rank of Commander and Chief of Enforcement for the Coast Guard in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean. And before joining Pew, he most recently served as the Director of Fisheries Operations for the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency based in the Solomon Islands, where he provided 15 Pacific Island countries, including Australia and New Zealand, with policy and operational advice and recommendations regarding international fisheries compliance and enforcement. So really pleased to welcome you, Mark, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the opportunity today. I, I think before I really get into this, maybe I should uh, answer the question, who, who is Pew Charitable Trust? What do they do? Well, the Pew Charitable Trusts are an independent, nonprofit, global research and public policy organization. They uh, still operate as a nonpartisan, non-government organization dedicated to serving the public, and they have quite an extensive uh, portfolio that uh, has grown over time. That is, uh, includes uh, public opinion research, arts and culture, as well as the environment and consumer policy initiatives. So this ending illegal fishing project, uh, which I work on with the, with the environment, is, uh, is just one small component of that. And since, uh, as you can see, uh, since 1993, Pew Charitable Trust has worked uh, and encouraged sustainable fisheries management protections for a lot of places on the ocean. That strategy was built upon uh, six different goals. And I won't read uh, each of those, but you can see the very last one, uh, reduce illegal fishing in the world's oceans is where I come in. So illegal fishing, especially as you alluded to, why is that a problem? Well, effectively managed for the long run, global fisheries can be a significant source of food and jobs for the world's population. However, illegal fishing significantly undermines that opportunity. It's a major threat to the long-term sustainability of the world's fisheries, as well as the livelihoods of millions of people who depend on ocean resources for food and income. It also undermines the effectiveness of broader efforts to restore ocean systems to a state of health and cost the world billions of dollars each year in lost revenue. In fact, uh, a very recent study indicated that more than $23 billion of fish are taken illegally from the world's oceans each year. That equates, if you go down to the market, that nearly one in five fish that you see there has potentially been taken illegally. Additionally, illegal fishing has a disproportionate impact on developing nations that have sizable population centers in coastal areas, that depend on fish for much of their animal protein that they consume. And finally, illegal fishing further exacerbates the problem of overfishing as the number of illegally caught fish is not factored into stock assessments and decisions by management authorities when they set fisheries quotas. So all in all, we believe that this is a problem worth solving. A little bit about uh, Pew's vision of what we call a global system of enforcement to ending illegal fishing, of which Project Eyes on the Seas is just a component or, or a tool, a piece of that. We look at that as a tapestry of agreements, policies, and enforcement mechanisms and technologies that are applicable to individual countries, can be applied regionally, 
and corresponds and complements multinational and global agreements to create a global strategy to bring about an end to IUU fishing or illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. I'd like to be clear here, though, that this system is not only about enforcement. It's also about the implementation of appropriate governance structures, structures that can prevent illegal fishing. The strength of this vision here comes from properly connecting all its different elements, whether new, established, or developing. Now within this global system of enforcement, we see that that is a system that facilitates a network of information on all aspects of fishing vessels from the owner, flag, and crew, that it shares information between appropriate authorities and has the capacity to link to international policing systems and fisheries management bodies to facilitate better informed decisions. Finally, can make information available where the necessary agreements are in place, very important, to entities in the private sector along the seafood supply chain to inform the market and drive due diligence at all stages within that uh, supply chain. Now, whether through a lack of resources or understanding or even apathy, government inaction still remains a barrier in the fight against illegal fishing, as well as towards this vision of a global system of enforcement. We believe we are capable of working alongside governments, the United Nations, or other international bodies to move towards the goal of a global system of enforcement. And to do this, we are crafting policy, technology, eyes on the seas being one of those tools under technology, as well as leadership tools that can be used by the global community in the overall effort to end illegal fishing. Now Pew's approach for a global system, uh, you can see Project Eyes on the Seas as a technology piece there in the center, revolves around the important piece of information sharing. And as that applies to both policy work uh, as well as the enforcement aspect. Unless we address the problem of illegal fishing in the world's oceans, which is really both a technical and political challenge, we're going to ultimately fail to reduce overfishing in a meaningful way. We strongly believe that it's possible to significantly reduce illegal fishing and to put in place a monitoring, surveillance, and information sharing system that can be effectively used by coastal states that will help to get large-scale illegal fishing vessels off the water. However, I should say, again, the use of technology should not be considered as the only solution. The, active, the effective implementation of an initiative such as Project Eyes on the Seas requires national, regional, and international policy changes. And we're working on many of these in a number of settings around the world. And as you can see on the left, policy, uh, port state measures agreement, the new international treaty that uh, should come into force here in 2016, that creates the policy framework for coastal states to share information amongst each other and a minimum of standards to conduct and record data on fishing vessel inspections. IMO numbers, or International Maritime Organization numbers. This creates a universal identification number that can be used to track vessels throughout their lifespan, regardless of change in ownership, name, or flag state. On the right, under enforcement, you can see Fish Eye Africa, another project that we have been involved with. This creates a novel approach to regional fisheries enforcement cooperation. The Fish Eye project has fostered collaboration across seven nations in Southeast Africa to share port inspection data, vessel registry data, as well as to deter IUU fishing in the region. Project scale with Interpol helped to uh, support Interpol in establishing the first ever environmental crime unit at Interpol dedicated to investigating illegal fishing and associated crimes. The project scale is designed to leverage Interpol criminal databases and international network to both contribute data to the system and benefit from its tracking and analysis. And then finally, the uh, analytical unit. Uh, we have worked hard to help establish an independent non-governmental analytical unit to act as a credible source of targeted fisheries intelligence analysis and data for the world. The unit would also be able to provide data and intelligence analysis for Project Eyes on the Seas. But even as we seek the policy changes, technology 
like I, Project Eyes on the Seas, provides a way to transform the very inefficient and expensive, what I call, needle in a haystack approach that is currently being used to detect illegal fishing vessels into a more precise and targeted tracking system, a system that can bring assurances to governments that they have either created marine reserves, that those reserves are being adequately enforced, or for those agencies charged with enforcing fisheries regulations, that fish are being caught in appropriate ways and in areas and by vessels that are officially approved for fishing. On to Project Eyes on the Seas. Project Eyes on the Seas is a partnership between the Pew Charitable Trust and Satellite Applications Catapult, which is a UK or United Kingdom government initiative created to help foster economic growth through the application of space technology and a technical center of excellence. The purpose of this partnership is to build an information systems platform that will allow a true near real time picture of industrial fishing activity around the globe. What we hope to see here is the end result will be a cost effective global fisheries monitoring and enforcement system that can be used by governments around the world, including even the most resource poor enforcement agencies, to monitor and detect illegal fishing activities affecting the world's oceans. The system will also allow retailers and the vast majority of commercial fishers who operate within the law to show buyers where, when, and how their fish were caught, thereby providing them a level of due diligence as well as managing risk for unintentionally bringing illegal fish caught into the market. The system uses cutting edge technology to merge satellite tracking and imagery data with other sources of information including fishing vessel databases on ownership and flag, as well as oceanographic data. It combines this information with computer algorithms and intelligence analysis to provide end users with a more complete picture of the maritime domain that they might have already have, and it alerts them to suspicious activity. The system will draw on several key satellite technologies and has the capacity to add more as they become relevant to combating illegal fishing. Now, there are four key components uh, to the system. I call them four pillars, uh, the first of which is satellite tracking of vessel transponders, and that would be either through AIS or VMS. The system uh, relies partly on the technology called AIS, Automatic Identification System, which is mandated by the International Maritime Organization as a collision avoidance system for most large commercial cargo and tanker vessels, research vessels, and passenger ships. Fishing vessels are currently exempt from the IMO regulations requiring AIS on the commercial and maritime vessels. However, many countries, as well as vessel owners, are increasingly requiring their fleets to carry AIS for better visibility and safety reasons. Each vessel carrying an AIS transponder sends out a near continuous VHF radio signal to other vessels announcing its present position, course and speed, and vessel identifying information. These signals are sent in the open via radio signal with a limited range, so historically the signals could only be received by other vessels when in sight of one another or by terrestrial monitoring stations when vessels were operating near the coast. However, advances in that type of technology now allow commercially operated low orbiting satellites to detect the signals from space, effectively allowing vessels to be tracked anywhere on Earth. These commercial providers are continually expanding their satellite constellations to provide better and cheaper coverage around the globe, which means better accuracy and less latency for the system to pinpoint a vessel's exact location anywhere on the globe in near real time. One challenge with AIS, though, is that because it operates as an open system, a vessel captain could tamper with the AIS signal to provide false or deceptive information about the vessel's identity or location or simply turn off the transponder to avoid detection. For this reason, basing a monitoring system like Project Eyes on the Seas on AIS alone is insufficient. AIS data has to be combined with other information from other satellite sources, as well as credible fishing vessel databases, corporate information, information on flag states allowing the system to cross-check satellite-derived data with known vessel registry information helping users 
to identify vessels that might be trying to what I call game the system. Project Eyes on the Seas also aims to incorp incorporate other forms of vessel tracking data and has recently as well, such as the satellite-based vessel monitoring system operated by regional fishery management bodies, sub-regional organizations, and national governments. VMS is different from AIS because it operates essentially on a closed system. The transponder units are installed on fishing vessels for the express purpose of monitoring by the responsible fisheries authorities. These units are much less susceptible to tampering than AIS, but countries are often reluctant to share this data with others as it will give away the location of their fleets and prime fishing areas. BMS is also only required where mandated by law, so nations may require the units only for certain vessels targeting certain species. As a result, though, both VMS and AIS, which have both been used within the system, are complementary forms of vessel location data, and Project Eyes on the Seas has incorporated both already within the system. The second pillar is satellite imagery. In addition to vessel transponder data, the system also uh, utilizes satellite imagery, mostly in the form of what we call synthetic aperture radar, or SAR for short, to provide a picture of what is happening at sea. SAR imagers provide a large picture of the ocean surface at a relatively low resolution. Although the image resolution is not high enough to identify specific vessels, SAR images can provide information on the presence or absence of vessels, and even speed and course of those vessels. Now when you combine this with other data, such as known AIS or VMS vessels in a region and their behavior, the system can make further inferences about what we call a dark vessel's activity using these images, where a dark vessel is a vessel that operates without any transponder. Other satellite imagery like thermal imaging or infrared image data can also be sourced for use by the system if needed. But most likely what and have done is using optical images that would be used to get information such as vessel type or if there's fishing activity occurring such as transshipping operations which might not be allowed. These images cover a smaller area but provide a much higher resolution than is used for detailed analysis. The third pillar is credible data. There is no single credible and complete global list of fishing vessels in existence. Vessel lists maintained by regional, regional fisheries management bodies often contain errata in vessel details and vessels may be added or deleted to the list each year Mark? that are not Yes. Now, are you moving from slide to slide? We're just seeing the global vessing, vessel tracking slide. Yes, I still have that up there. Okay, I'm just checking. ready to move on from okay. that slide. Okay, just so, checking to make sure. <laughs> still on that same slide. There's a lot of information that I'm talking about under the same one, but I'm ready to move on. Okay, no problem. <laughs> okay. Um, Eyes on the Seas uh, uses, the system uses a proprietary database that combines regional lists, national vessel registries, and fisheries intelligence data to create a more complete and credible global list of vessels. And then the last of these four pillars, and uh, I'll move on with the slide, is automation. One of the biggest challenges in fisheries enforcement is the ability to track thousands of fishing vessels that may be operating in an area at any given time. To help identify legal behavior, Project Eyes on the Seas is building into the system several types of automatic notifications, which will essentially narrow down the focus from thousands of vessels to just a handful of fishing vessels that are engaged in suspicious or illegal activity. For example, the system will alert users when AIS signal anomalies occur, such as when a vessel's AIS suddenly switches off before it's about to enter a marine reserve or possibly even an exclusive economic zone where it has no license to fish. The system will also use advanced computer algorithms to automatically detect vessel movement and associate it with categories of activity indicative of fishing, transshipment, or even crossing geographic boundaries. And that allows the user to narrow their focus down from the thousands of vessels at sea to ones that may warrant further investigation. Now, as you can see here with that technology overview of the system, 
We have satellite tracking and observational data from multiple sources. And what does that equate to? That gives us location and time and behavior of vessels operating at sea. Now, when those are coupled with vessel databases, registry, arrivals, departures, licenses, authorization, authorizations, work schedules, we get a, an indication of true identity of vessels uh, operating at sea. What you see now in front of you is, a, is essentially a snapshot of the system. Now, maybe to the untrained observer, that just looks like a bunch of squiggly lines. But to those of us involved with fisheries uh, monitoring, control, and surveillance, this picture tells me a lot. And it shows just uh, it shows vessels that are operating out there, long lines that show historical tracks of vessels with the different colors equating to different speeds of the vessels, which provide an indication of what type of activity they might be involved in. See, what I just brought up now is a, an example of the correlated, uncorrelated synthetic aperture radar detections that might indicate the presence of vessels that are operating without transponders. Those are those small yellow circles that are out there. Uh, and that uh, corresponds on the right that provides a thumbnail uh, sketch of that data that shows the indication that there is indeed a, an object uh, that is operating out there without a transponder. That is coupled with, in the upper right-hand corner, a comprehensive cross-reference vessel identity, vessel risk profile is, and information on vessels. All the relevant regional fishery management organizations as well as the license and authorization lists associated with a specific vessel. The system also shows vessel types and background by color coding. Different colors indicating fishing, fishing versus non-fishing as well as the amount of cross-reference data that is available through different data sets. There are automated machine-generated alerts for activity of interest, such as fishing, especially indications of the speed, that uh, speed changes and direction uh, of movement of the vessel that may uh, indicate setting of gear or collecting of gear, as well as uh, when two vessels uh, come together to indicate potential transshipping at sea. The system also provides an opportunity for the analyst to be able to look at the position, speed, and time rendered in two frames of reference uh, for at-a-glance comparison uh, for speed uh, for two vessels that might be operating together to, again, give you a clear picture of potential activity, uh, especially transshipping at sea. So in the end, what does eyes on the seas really mean? It's a combination of two things. Productivity enhancing technology, where you combine multiple data sets together, as well as information. You couple that with expert fisheries and enforcement analysts that can make sense out of the information they're seeing on the system. And you are able to provide a product that is analytical support uh, as well as us moving toward more extensive vessel risk profiling uh, and further down the road, possibly even system training as we look to make the system more deployable so that users of the system can leverage eyes on the seas more directly. Those uh, analysts provide support to governments, authorities, and even retail supply chains to deliver one of the most important things that you need in fisheries monitoring, compliance, and, enf and enforcement, and that's credible, actionable insights into what's happening on the water. Using what we call this risk profiling methodology, we can use these insights and translate them into what we call a vessel compliance risk index 
that can be used by both authorities and seafood retail supply chains to make better informed decisions, whether or not uh, you should launch an aircraft or a patrol vessel uh, to specifically seek out a vessel for the activity uh, it's uh, indicating, or, or whether to what to more specifically look at uh, on a vessel for an inspection or even for retailers uh, to be able to manage their risk in and in, in conduct better due diligence for sourcing seafood product. What about the future for Project Eyes on the Seas? PU's end, uh, the Ending Illegal Fishing Project, which uh, I'm involved in, is driving the development of Project Eyes on the Seas as only one piece of a multifaceted approach to end the global problem of illegal fishing. Each piece of the campaign, of whether or not it's technology through Project Eyes on the Seas or whether it's policy work or even the leadership tools, seeks to achieve a major advancement in technology or international policy that is integral to the overall goal of creating a global system of enforcement that can be used by governments in the world, rich or poor, on an equitable basis. Each of these pieces complements Project Eyes on the Seas by creating new methods of collaboration, credible sources of data, and partners that both contribute and benefit from the data and analysis. I'd like to remind everyone that there's really no silver bullet to ending illegal fishing. Project Eyes on the Seas is not a silver bullet. It's just an additional tool. In the end, though, what you need is a multifaceted approach which enables authorities to stay one step ahead of illegal fishers. We know that what we know is that in the days of physically chasing individual illegal fishing vessels on the open ocean are coming to an end. It's simply too expensive, even for developed countries. We need to eliminate safe havens and loopholes that allow legal fishing to take place so that the vessels have nowhere to Unless we address the problem of illegal fishing in the world's oceans, both the technical and political challenges, as I said previously, we will ultimately fail to reduce overfishing in a meaningful way. We strongly believe that it's possible to significantly reduce illegal fishing worldwide to enforce regulations or restrictions on fishings in both marine reserves as well as, well as those areas where fishing is authorized and to put in place a monitoring, surveillance, and information sharing system that can be effectively used by states that will help to get rid of large-scale illegal fishing vessels off the water. So with that, I think I'll stop there and, and see whether or not there's any questions. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, that was that was terrific overview, and I'm sure there will be questions. I see some already have come in, so I encourage those on the line, if you have questions, please go ahead and type those in and we will try to get to your questions. And I would also just like to note that this presentation will be, the recording will be posted on open channels for anyone who wants to go back and listen to it or share it with colleagues and uh, also on the MPA Center's website. So we do have a few questions here and, and I will also note that um, we will provide these questions to Mark so he can follow up with some of you individually. Um, I think some of these questions are, are big picture and others are about specific opportunities to collaborate. So first question is from Eileen Alicia and she asks, can this be applied to small islands, small boat artisanal fisheries or is it really only for large scale fisheries? That, that is a good question. As of now with the, with the technologies that, that, that are in place, the system is designed for the more industrial uh, scale vessels out there, the larger vessels. However, uh, and, and it depends as uh, national requirements uh, further on down the line, uh, if when vessels are outfitted with transponders, whether VMS or AIS, even if they're smaller vessels, uh, there's the ability to have access to um, the tracking data for those vessels. Right now there's uh, Unless there is a national mandate for that, uh, those uh, transponders, whether it's AIS or VMS, is uh, really rele relegated to the larger vessels. But as that, in time, as that goes down to smaller and smaller vessels, uh, 
those type of vessels and fleets uh, could be tracked and more effectively monitored. Um, some of the satellite technology has limitations, though. Artisanal fleets of uh, small wooden vessels are not are not easily, if at all, picked up by such technology as synthetic aperture radar, which really uh, looks at the ocean surface and looks for large steel objects uh, that are out there. Uh, so the, there are some difficulties associated with it, uh, with some of the technology, but uh, the, it doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity to be able to track um, smaller fleets in time. And I just wanted to note that there was also a similar question from Ravi Maharaja, who uh, is from Trinidad and Tobago, who notes that fishermen are constantly harassed and threatened by piracy from South American subcontinent, and it definitely is interested in how the project can contribute to these issues at the, for smaller fisheries. So there's also um, a question asking, are there any plans as part of this project to look at alternative economic options for uh, illegal fishers who may be poor and, and that's their only livelihood? Can you repeat that question for the yeah. system? Basically, there, there's a question, and it may be outside the scope of Eyes on the Sea, but just uh, a question about um, how do we address the larger systemic question of people are doing the illegal fishing because they don't have other livelihoods, and they, it, it's, they're poor, and this is what they need to do. Well, <laughs> I think that is kind of uh, out of the scope of uh, Project Eyes on the Seas, but I wouldn't say that uh, um, that those type of uh, individuals that are doing that type of fishing are, are generally just going to be considered illegal. Um, and certainly there's, there's a lot of work that uh, is involved with uh, community-based enforcement um, type of thing that could address some of that as well. But uh, again, I think that's probably outside the scope of eyes on the, ski, eyes on the seas and, and the area that we're looking at. Well, getting back to the big picture, there are a couple of questions asking how Eyes on the Seas relates to Global Fishing Watch. Can okay. you comment on that? Well, I, you know, um, I'm not, I don't think I will, it's appropriate for me to just to do a side-by-side -side comparison. But I, I, oh. I think there are differences, and, and I think I should just concentrate on what our system does and would encourage others to take a look at uh, the Global Fishing Watch uh, and... Uh, and see where they could see those differences. So, um, I, we Mark, maybe the maybe I could just add that the one part of the question was: um, Are are the two projects collaborating? Are there any plans for uh, working together? Um, as of this time, there's uh, there's no collaboration between the two. I think uh, I can say that Global Fishing Watch is more of a public facing for uh, activities that are occurring uh, at sea. Uh, with fishing vessels, um, where Project Eyes on the Seas is really designed for uh, governments and those authorities, to, especially in developing countries, to provide greater access to information uh, that they could use to facilitate more effective or efficient enforcement, uh, as well as information for retailers to, to conduct greater due diligence in that regard. Um, and let me just say that it, Project Eyes is unique in several ways here. It utilizes multiple satellite technologies and vessel databases rather than relying on a single source. It's being developed as a tool, as I said, to assist governments with monitoring and enforcement. The system's already up, operating now. A matter of fact, we completed several trials over the past year uh, from monitoring uh, a marine reserve to, to helping governments with monitoring uh, to ensure uh, legal fishing activity is occurring with their waters. And it's using near real-time data for that. The system also has the added benefit of being able to properly manage non-public domain data as well as classified information and to protect it in a secure environment, uh, which was the reason why we were able to, uh, several governments shared their VMS data as part of the system. Uh, and uh, was used within the system itself. 
The project also encourages uh, information sharing between authorities and countries and has applications not only to enforcement but also, uh, as I said, uh, retailers for traceability purposes. It's uh, inherently flexible and can be integrated with existing systems, not meant to replace already frameworks that are out there and operating effectively, but maybe possibly filling gaps uh, that, uh, that exist in uh, current monitoring frameworks. And uh, the system can also help deploy tactical assets such as uh, vessels or even unmanned vehicles to area where potential illegal activity has been identified. And by doing this and having that targeted deployment, it leads to greater efficiencies in law enforcement operations. In time, we, we look to also have the system be able to incorporate crowdsourced data and as well as possibly provide information to the public as well. Thanks, Mark. And are there certain places in the world where this is um, being used more than others right now? Well, we just, uh, just recall that uh, Project Eyes on the Seas officially became operational up and running in January of 2015. So essentially this first year has been uh, a year of trial projects. Uh, we've uh, had a trial project uh, to support uh, several members of the Polynesian Leader Group uh, in the Pacific with monitoring their waters. And we did that uh, in conjunction uh, in collaboration with the Forum Fisheries Agency and their, and their monitoring control and surveillance framework that they have up there. Um, we also um, uh, provided monitoring support over the uh, Pitcairn uh, EEZ, which uh, is a, an area that uh, the United Kingdom is looking at to uh, designate as a uh, marine reserve, um, a full no-take marine reserve. Okay. Um, following on that uh, topic about the Pitcairn and, and very remote areas, there's a question from Richard Dunn who's asking, to what extent is Eyes on the Sea viable for remote areas where there may be no aircraft or patrol vessels to follow up on a detection? I, and that's an excellent question because uh, it, it is, and having served in the Coast Guard 23 years, I can, I can tell you just uh, at sea enforcement is the most expensive uh, way to try to ensure enforcement uh, of rules and regulations. Uh, and certainly the ability to um, conduct uh, inspections uh, and boardings and conduct your efforts at shore is a more efficient way of being able to conduct that business. Hence why we are so supportive of uh, such mechanisms as such as the Port State Measures Agreement and that provides a greater ability uh, for countries to be able to work together uh, in that regard, share information. And it's through those mechanisms that uh, uh, help in regards to monitoring the remote areas. Uh, as long as you're able to sit there and identify a specific vessel operating suspiciously uh, in a particular remote area, you can be able to track that vessel uh, until he arrives in a port, which eventually uh, he will do. And uh, employing such mechanisms as uh, the uh, Port State Measures Agreement and for that port state to be able to conduct an investigation on that vessel, uh, that would be tied to looking at the activities during the time, uh, time frame in mind where he displayed potential illegal activity in a, in a remote marine protected area, uh, they could find further evidence that would document uh, that illegal activity which uh, could then be followed up on um, with that port state working with the affected coastal state where that activity occurred in. No, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so this, you, you kind of addressed to this next question from Sarah Jones, and it has to do with how we make sure that this technology, which is so powerful, can be used by both developed countries and less developed countries, and uh, kind of making sure that the, the benefits um, are felt by those who really don't have a lot of resources and need this assistance. And that's a good question. The one important aspect of this is the partnership uh, that was put together that, uh, that formed Project Eyes on the Seas, and that's the Pew Charitable Trust and, and Satellite Applications Catapult are, are 
nonprofit organizations, not looking to develop a commercial enterprise uh, to be able to do this type of work at a commercial cost. Uh, the, the system is designed not to be cost prohibitive. There's a lot of commercial entities out there right now who have developed solutions for maritime surveillance and monitoring that are using similar technologies. But these solutions are prohibitively expensive for, for small island developing countries or coastal states uh, who need to protect their vast expanses of ocean with relatively very few patrol resources. Uh, we think that Project Eyes on the Seas offers a more robust solution at a lower cost for these uh, resource poor nations. That's uh, the ability, again, by it not being a commercial enter enterprise, uh, and being able to take data uh, and use data across multiple users, which lowers the cost for that as well. Uh, there's a question from Robert Walsh, who works on uh, marine debris, I think, and is asking, it, would it be possible to connect Eyes on the Sea to tracking the dumping of ghost nets for retrieval and or accountability? Good question. These are all good questions. <laughs> I, possibly. Um, again, there's, we are finding, especially through AIS and satellite technologies, that you can track uh, many different things uh, across the globe, not only terrestrial, um, trucks, cars, whatever, uh, as well as on the water. As long as, a, as long as gear that uh, might uh, be used by a fishing vessel uh, is tapped with a, with a tracking device, you might be able to uh, more effectively monitor whether or not uh, a, a vessel uh, discards that gear um, and then be able to uh, associate that gear with that particular vessel uh, in of itself without any type of uh, tracking mechanism for that. Uh, I think the system with the satellite technology, um, it, it would be difficult to be able to track a gear in the water without some type of tracking uh, device associated with it. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the uh, question about sort of uh, con countries with less capacity, and you had mentioned training as kind of a phase three of your um, outlook for Eyes on the Sea. There's a question about, you know, what Pew's plans are for training governments to use the platform and also provide that kind of technical assistance about how to manage a system and interpret the data and all of those kinds of questions. Well, again, that, uh, you know, that phase of this uh, is uh, clearly aspirational now, having only been in operation a little over for a year. But it's, uh, it, it's an avenue that uh, we are moving in, especially in the coming year, to, to look at ways the system can become more deployable. And in becoming more deployable, uh, it offers the ability to, for governments to more directly use the system than rely just specifically on, uh, on the framework that we have in place now, which is actually based in, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom, but actually can be used direct, directly by uh, those users at the end. So as we are able to uh, develop the system further uh, to uh, increase the ability for that this system to be deployable, uh, certainly an aspect of that will come into play and that's uh, training end users on, on the ability to uh, be able to use the system. So there's a couple of questions about, um, you know, kind of challenges. There was a question about clouds and how those might uh, get in the way of, of looking at images and how you address that. Certainly uh, clouds do uh, come into play, especially when you look at what we call the electro uh, optical or EO, uh, taking pictures from, from space. Uh, clouds can certainly have an impact uh, on the ability to take uh, a, effective pictures of potential activity that is occurring on there, so that, that does have an impact on that. Uh, technologies out there, such as infrared or even the synthetic aperture radar, where the, it doesn't depend on cloud coverage for you to be able to detect objects out on the water. So it depends on uh, the type of technology. Certainly uh, transponders are not affected by um, cloud coverage whatsoever, but there are some technologies that are. 
and that's a, you need to be judicious in, in use of those technologies based upon what current environmental conditions are, where you're, where you're looking at, and, and put those into play. And there's a question about whether you have worked with um, foreign fishing companies to integrate drifting fish aggregation device buoy GPS tracks into the system and compare those to AIS fishing vessel tracks. That's a good question too. That is one of the areas that uh, we are looking at now. And there's, uh, as you can imagine, especially with the tuna fishery, uh, the, there are thousands, literally thousands, of what we call fish aggregating devices or FADs being placed in the water to attract schools of tuna to, to make it more efficient and effective for the fishing vessels to be able to um, collect catch uh, around these uh, different objects. Uh, in the Pacific, uh, they are commencing the FAD tracking programs there, uh, and with those programs, uh, Project Eyes on the Seas has the potential to be able to provide support to that and conduct FAD tracking that could then be associated or tied toward monitoring uh, who is using particular FADs. Um, that's, a, that's an emerging area of uh, interest and work, and uh, we hope to be able to be involved with that uh, as that moves forward. So a couple of similar questions around the future of Eyes on the Sea and, and how countries, I understand it's been kind of in this early testing stages, but if there are countries who want to get access to it, um, how does that happen? Do they contact Pew and make a formal agreement? Um, but how, how do you uh, respond to queries from governments? I think uh, probably the best the best source is I've, I've got my email address on here. You can you can uh, reach out to me directly uh, with that. Uh, we work with our team that's uh, uh, over at uh, Satellite Applications Catapult to be able to uh, uh, put together a response and engage those who uh, have an interest in that. Uh, but it's it's all about reaching out, and you certainly can reach out and touch me with. Uh, with my uh, email address that uh, I've put, uh, put on the screen. Great, thank and, you. Uh, and, we'll, and We'd be happy to respond to that, all those and inquiries. Th this again is kind of longer term, maybe looking out into the future. You mentioned the vision being a self-sustaining uh, ability to, to conduct these activities. Is it viewed that there would be a separate organization? Or, or well, how do you see the, the sort of long-term future of Eyes on the Sea? Well, the future of Eyes on the Seas is that uh, we certainly would like to see that the system uh, it has the capacity and capability uh, to be self-sustaining and not rely on uh, just potential donor funding for it to, to be uh, for it to move forward. Uh, so self-sustaining uh, independent entity uh, that um, is able to charge for the services to recoup the cost of operating, not as a commercial enterprise, but as a as a nonprofit public good uh, type of entity, uh, but uh, the using um, what they charge for the system to go back into sustaining uh, the actual entity um, in the long term, and that was that would be either through through engagements with governments uh, for. Uh, that support and use, or as well retailers uh, looking to uh, provide greater due diligence uh, for their sourcing of sea seafood. Uh, but again, on a nonprofit uh, public good avenue, not as a commercial enterprise. Yeah, you've mentioned retailers a couple of times. Have you had interest from retailers in uh, using this tool as a way to, uh, you know, verify the sustainability of the of their supplies? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we we've had numerous uh, inquiries on that, and are actually uh, working with a few right now that uh, to do trials uh, of the system, uh, with the hopes that we might uh, expand it even further. But uh, uh, we have uh, seen that there is a definite interest uh, on the retailer side, which is pretty powerful uh, because when you're able to. Uh, having myself been involved with the compliance enforcement nearly my entire professional life looking at and fisheries enforcement from one avenue, um, you know, turning, turning things around to be able to bring market forces to bear 
to help bring about an end to uh, illegal fishing is pretty powerful, where you can more shine a spotlight on those that are operating within the law and then be able to more uh, directly determine those that are not, who are not willing to um, share their vessel transponder data with anyone. They don't, that, uh, and if retailers uh, want, uh, want uh, to be able to purchase uh, seafood product from a vessel, that they should be able to have the opportunity to uh, say we want to make sure that you operate it in a legal way and in a transparent way. And that has a, a the market forces are, are pretty powerful uh, in that aspect. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, so um, there are a couple of questions that have to do with how accurate and effective the system is. And one in particular about Pitcairn, is, is there any um, feedback you can provide about how, this, how the system is uh, working in terms of being used as an enforcement tool or a surveillance tool? Um, I, I don't have metrics that I could give, um, but uh, certainly the, uh, the pit care and trial provided an opportunity to really gauge the amount of uh, vessel traffic uh, that is uh, engaged uh, in, that, uh, in that region. Um, certainly we, have, we are, did not have the ability to track every vessel. The, the, a lot of vessels with VMS we might not have had, but certainly the different technologies there gave us indications of presence of vessels. Um, but uh, because of the way the technology was merged and used, we were able to tell that even the vessels that um, we did not, what we would consider our dark vessels, but are probably operating on VMS, uh, the way that they were operating did not show indications of uh, loitering or potential fishing activity uh, within, uh, within the uh, Pitcairn uh, EEZ uh, to indicate potential illegal fishing. Uh, we were able to determine through the, um, through the different uh, technologies that those vessels were, were operating in a way that was consistent with uh, just transiting. And there's a question from Christina Border who's asking, um, is there a measure to act about how accurately the system can pick up different vessel movement types? Now, I'm trying to understand vessel, different vessel movement types. Uh, maybe, uh, what uh, I can, what I can say ahead. is that the vessels operate at sea uh, consistently with the type of gear that they use, whether or not that might be trawling or whether it's long lining. Or, or whether it's purseining. And to someone who's been involved with uh, fisheries and fisheries monitoring control and, and surveillance, you can take a look at a vessel's movement on the water and be able to determine that it, it's operating consistent with laying of its gear or picking up of its gear or whether or not it's conducting fishing activity as opposed to just strict transiting. Um, in of itself, uh, there's additional information that you would need to actually prove that that was happening, but it provides uh, an indication that, that gives appropriate authorities uh, the information they need to conduct further investigation to provide uh, that evidence of that activity occurring. Uh, but certainly the, the vessel movements do tell a story uh, based mm -hmm. upon uh, what gear is uh, involved with that particular vessel. And so when you're following a, a vessel, um, are you predicting its movements or tracking it uh, based on speed, or do you have other algorithms that you use to, uh, to anticipate vessel movements? Uh, we don't have algorithms to, to determine anticipated movements of vessels, but what we have is uh, ongoing work in developing algorithms that will uh, provide alerts uh, through machine learning, automatic alerts that will help you filter through literally thousands of uh, vessels that are being uh, monitored on the screen to, to highlight for you very quickly when those movements are indicative of potential fishing activity which then, to a trained analyst, you can provide a, a, a much closer look at the activity of that vessel. There's a lot of vessels that operate on there, but it's about filtering through those vessels 
uh, to more quickly uh, determine in in greater real time uh, the activity that is being, that is involved with a particular vessel. Because again, what's important here is the be, the ability to put together actionable information that can be used by authorities for follow up, whether or not it's a, a, a launching of an aircraft or a patrol vessel uh, to go seek out the, a particular vessel, or whether it's not uh, enough to uh, initiate an investigation uh, if a vessel pulls into port. So a port inspector knows more clearly what he's looking for in regards to the activities of a vessel that is operating out there. So there are a couple of questions about um, what a rich source this is for data and the potential for this to be used to inform future policy or understanding. And one area is the, is the high seas. Are, and are you able to then uh, or plan to kind of an, analyze areas of the high seas where uh, a lot of fishing is taking place and, and how that might help inform future management of those areas? Certainly that is uh, an, uh, an area of interest, uh, depending on the data set or the data sources. Um, keep in mind that some of the data source is what we call open source, or you can buy the data through commercial sources such as AIS. Some of the data is proprietary or, or classified. Uh, information in the system that is classified or defined as what we call non-public domain or law enforcement sensitive such as uh, VMS position data or other proprietary commercial data, um, that data has to be protected and maintained with a secure environment for reasons of maintaining trust with nations and law enforcement agencies that contribute to the system. And as well to maintain the credibility of the information so that it is used to its fullest in future law enforcement operations or even prosecutions. However, having said that, with careful redaction to make certain data anonymous, potential information can be made to the public. Uh, and, and, and we see, along with the open source information, and coupled with carefully redacted data, you, you can do some uh, uh, fairly extensive uh, analysis of activity that is occurring on the high seas or in other areas of interest, depending on your user. Yeah, I, th I think there's definitely some interest in that topic among folks who are on the webinar, and I, I see a couple of people who have mentioned, you know, the interest in working with you on research, and uh, they have your contact information, so you may be hearing That'd from some great. of them. Sure. Uh, and just speaking of collaboration, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, uh, Menenzies, excuse me, who uh, runs a project in the Azores on the Condor Seamount, which is closed to fishing, uh, but just also trying to understand how seamount fisheries recover from fishing. And so it might be a great place to test the system. And so I think he will be also reaching out to you. That, that's great. Look forward to it. Uh, so there's a question from Mark Eakin who asks or mentions that there are a number of remotely sensed products that fishermen use to direct their fishing activities and others like Turtle Watch that help fishermen avoid illegal bycatch. And have you considered using these to see how the fishing that you identify matches areas that fishing uh, fishers are likely to either target or avoid? Um, I wouldn't say that we have used those as of yet, but uh, certainly the, as we move forward, we're looking at what is the power behind the system, and that is the ability to use multiple data sets, not rely upon a single data set not reply, uh, rely totally on AIS as the means for monitoring, but put in multiple data sets uh, that can be integrated together into what we call a common operating picture uh, that is much more powerful. So um, because we haven't looked at it yet doesn't mean we don't want to look at it or we wouldn't want to incorporate it. Um, all those different data sets uh, hold a lot of potential to be a able to add value to the system that is uh, that would be worthy of uh, consideration. Okay, we have to wrap up here in just a minute, but I have one last question. It kind of gets back to the um, supply chain issue we were talking about with retailers, and the question was whether Pew is, is either currently or plans to work with uh, certification organizations to connect up the information on uh, where the catch is coming from with seafood certification. 
Um, I, I, there might be potential for that. Uh, I don't think we have anything active right now in regards to that. Uh, it's uh, more our efforts uh, in the past few months have been directed at uh, very interested uh, large-scale retailers in regards to that, uh, but certainly there are potential opportunities out there uh, that uh, that might uh, involve engagement uh, with those uh, uh, those type of systems as well. Okay, well, I just want to thank everybody for all your questions. I know we didn't get to every single one, uh, but they will be passed on to Mark, and you all have his contact information, so please feel free. <laughs> I hope you are, don't get an avalanche of emails, Mark, but uh, obviously <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of interest in this project, and so I really want to thank you for joining us today, and I want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us as well. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. Thank you very much.